Chapter 3, Sibling Feud I had no idea a storm was brewing, one that would turn into a raging rivalry with a sibling I didn't know I had. But in 1963, my mother told me Mama would be arriving, accompanied by my sister Cynthia. What sister? I couldn't remember my mother ever being pregnant. How could I have a sister? Then again, no one ever explained to me the fundamentals of childbirth, so I probably thought at the time that my mother's pregnancy was her normal shape. Seeing Cynthia for the first time was for me a traumatic experience. I racked my brain trying to figure out what was really going on. Yes, Cynthia was supposed to be my sister, but were we really truly related? She resembled absolutely no one I knew, not my mother, mama, aunties, uncles, or me. Cynthia was a dainty and extremely light-skinned girl with shoulder-length hair and a quality of vulnerable shyness. But the moment we acknowledged one another's presence, it was pure hatred. I would come to call her cow, which earned me plenty of biblical beatings. During the few days Mama stayed with us, she cooked some of her famous sweet potato pies and delectable gumbo. To me, she was the best cook in the world. Her cornbread melted like butter in my mouth, and her fried chicken, catfish, potato salad, collard greens, and sweet corn were good enough to eat for breakfast. The presence of Mama had a tranquilizing effect on me. I tried to convince Mama to stay longer, but she had to get back to New Orleans. When it was time for her to leave, we hugged while she whispered in my ear, Tookie, be nice, you hear? Be nice. That was the first inkling I had that she knew of my antipathy for my sister. It didn't take long for my mother and Cynthia to bond like two peas in a pod. My mother's preferential treatment of Cynthia allowed my sister to manipulate the situation to her advantage. It was obvious from Jump Street that our sister-brother relationship had deteriorated before it got started. For us, it was blow by blow, pain for pain, and verbal abuse for verbal abuse. Our aversion for one another was defined by our actions and then the usage of the word mother. Cynthia or I would emphasize personal ownership by saying, my mother said for you too. We acted like our mother belonged to only one of us, but never both. I knew the struggle for my mother's attention was a lost cause for me. It was out of spite that I fought for the sake of fighting. Many of my biblical beatings were due to my attempts to keep Cynthia out of my space and from getting on my nerves. One day I was sitting on the couch trying to heal after a beating for going outside when I wasn't supposed to. From the couch, I could see Cynthia in the single bedroom she shared with our mother, giggling, jumping around, and pointing at me. Anger, I wanted to throw something at her that wouldn't break. I reached underneath the couch pillow to retrieve my hidden yellow dart. I focused, aimed, and threw the dart with accuracy of a sharpshooter and hit her right between the eyes. She screamed so loud that I knew there would be hell to pay. But that beating wasn't too bad, knowing Cynthia was in pain too. Neither Cynthia nor I could fathom the importance of a real brother and sister relationship. We fought like cats and dogs. She had everybody but me fooled with her sweet little girl act. The nursery rhyme about girls being sugar and spice and everything nice was not applicable to her. She was a crafty instigator, fabricator, and manipulator. Whatever Cynthia said I had done, my mother believed. She saw me compared to Cynthia as aggressive, vindictive, and devious. As a member of the black male species living in a ghetto microcosm, circumstances dictated that I either be prey or predator. It didn't require deep reflection to determine which of the two I prefer. As a predator, Cynthia was my prey. I was a quick study armed with contaminated knowledge, and Cynthia didn't stand a chance. She was more devious at buttering up our mother and therefore to cause trouble for me. But to avoid corporal punishment, I learned to finesse and outfox Cynthia. At home, Cynthia held a superior position. She served as our mother's third eye and ear. She would spy on me like the Central Intelligence Agency and then report back to our mother when she returned home from work. On rare occasions, Cynthia could be bribed with nickels to keep her mouth shut. I led her to believe that a nickel was worth more than a dime because the nickel was bigger. <laughs> I used to charm her with few magic tricks, making black cough drops appear out of my ear, or with the matchbox trick where a coin disappears into the matchbox. She enjoyed eating the cough drops, which helped to silence her. I guess magic appealed to Cynthia. 
She also believed in the Tooth Fairy, Santa Claus, and the Easter Bunny. We never had any affectionate sibling moments. Perhaps neither of us had any to give. We were as unlike as night and day. Our differences were sealed forever when I saw her naked the first time. As a young boy, I had not yet grasped the biological distinctions between males and females. I was shocked to learn that Cynthia did not possess the male organ. I was tempted to question my mother about these issues, but such discussions were taboo for us. I just chalked it up as more of Cynthia's weirdness. I noticed that sibling rivalries in the households of friends were a bit adversarial occasionally, but tame in comparison to our few. Though I hated her deeply, I discovered that there was a limit to my expressions of malice. Where we lived, on the other side of the fence, there was a construction site and a huge dirt lot with deep trenches, a place where neighborhood children often played. On any given day, children would have rock fights, play marbles, wrestle, or play war games with BB guns or wooden swords. Here and there lay piles of lumber pipes, wires, nails, large buckets, and heavy machinery. Some of the trenches were too wide to cross. Over one such trench, I constructed a makeshift bridge out of several long wooden planks and booby trapped the bridge to collapse so a person would fall into the six foot deep trench. Below, I placed numerous heavy planks with long thick spike nails pointed upward. This bridge of doom was a payback from whoever I despised. Along came Cynthia. One day I spotted her skipping her merry way through the lock. The moment she stepped down onto the boards, I was ready to snatch the rope and send her tumbling down on the bed of the nails. Cynthia was halfway across and I was about to yank the rope, but something stopped me. It was neither fear nor concern about a potential beating that stopped me. I just couldn't do it to her. Perhaps it was a moment of conscience. Though, later in my young life, I would readily snatch that same rope to harm would-be enemies. As much as I despised Cynthia, the booby trap was something I could not execute. Yet, our feud continued well into our teenage years.